Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, the founder of The Complete Herbal Guide. And today I'm very excited because we have Dr. Valise. He's a board certified family medicine physician with his clinical areas of interest in preventive medicine, integrative medicine, and geriatric medicine. And he plays a massive role in helping people age well as they grow older. So I'm very excited to see what Dr. Valise has to say and all the great advice he's going to give us. So Dr. Valise, tell us a little about yourself and what you do and, you know, just let us know all these great things. Sure. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm always excited to talk about geriatric medicine. Uh, I'm a board certified family medicine physician in beautiful Carmel, California. So we're currently avoiding the heat wave. I'm like the rest of the <laughs> state of California. <laughs> uh, we're excited, you know, to, to come here today and talk a little bit about geriatric healthcare and how it's really changed since the pandemic. I know it's affected everyone differently, but I wanted to talk about specifically on how it's affected our geriatric patients and how we can move forward to focusing on healthy aging. So right. with a little bit of my integrative background, just kind of incorporating that with traditional medicine as well. Okay. You know, like people, as we get older, um, we start to, you know, become deficient in a lot of vitamins and nutrients and people, I think one thing that people don't understand is our health. The things we put in our body play such a huge impact on how we feel, our energy levels, how we look, our skin, everything. It plays a toll on all our organs, our heart, you know, and maybe you could give people advice and explain to people how important health is, the, the foods we put in our body, how much of a role, how much of an impact it plays in our health. Sure. So whenever I get a new patient coming in and we, you know, we start to build rapport and have a discussion about their overall wellness and health, I always emphasize the foundation of good health. And that's always a good balanced diet and hydration. And surprisingly, when you really walk through with patients, what that looks like, and a fun exercise I like to have with my patients is I have them tell me everything they ate the day before. And once mm -hmm. we break down every meal, we see that they may be deficient in vitamins in terms of vegetables and fruits and basics. And they say, you know what? I actually didn't drink as much water, but yesterday was an exception. And it's always funny because we always make excuses and I'm guilty of it as well, that we forget that the foundations of good health are really a well-balanced diet and hydration. So once we really focus in on those two things and we say, hey, we're doing these things right, then we can consider, okay, let's look at the next steps before we do a large blood work, workup or any kind of imaging. That's always my basics especially with our geriatric patients, dehydration is, is a big problem. And uh, once you look at how much water you actually have to drink, you know, those six to eight glasses as recommended, it's a full-time job and I'm guilty of it too. Uh, yeah. You know, I kind of have to have my minimum requirements before noon and three o'clock to remind myself that I need to be drinking adequate water. So uh, the real challenge is getting adequate, basic foundation of good vegetables, full balanced diet of proteins as well. Now, you know, Many people don't realize um, um, how easily it is to become dehydrated. A lot of people in America, especially, are big coffee drinkers. You know, a lot of people in other countries like Europe are big tea drinkers. But coffee drinkers, you know, people don't realize how dehydrated, how quickly you can become. And a lot of times people will become fatigued. They'll get that crash, that caffeine crash, and they become dehydrated because of all the caffeine they consumed in their body. But they don't realize that it's because either the coffee or not consuming en enough of water in their system. Can you tell people how important drinking water is for our body and releasing the toxins and all that other good stuff? Definitely. And as a coffee drinker myself, it is very dehydrating. And it's important that, like I said, when you think of the six to eight water glasses of water you should be having, and you were to put that lined up in front of you, it's quite a bit of water. And as we age, you know, we become way more susceptible to dehydration. So in when you're younger, it may seem easy to go a whole day with just one glass of water. And people even brag about it, which I think is always interesting. They say, oh, I only <laughs> had one glass of water. Like, um, for me, it's important to understand that making sure that our kidneys stay healthy by adequate hydration. As we age, our kidney function slightly decreases. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we adequately drink that water to keep our kidneys happy and healthy. And of course, keeping all of these toxins out of our system is a great way that our body naturally filters it with water. So it's a hard sell sometimes uh, as someone who's on the front line selling water. Uh, people, you know, have adverse reactions to taste. It doesn't taste the same. Uh, but 
you know, so much of our body is composed of water that it's important that we remember to be aggressive with our hydration especially as we age, dehydration becomes very problematic. And so many of the issues I see in clinic in terms of feeling lightheaded or fatigue are really solved or can be really easily dealt with with adequate hydration. Now, what are some of the foods that you recommend that people incorporate in their daily uh, diet or even weekly diet? Because, you know, you're not going to eat the same foods every day. But what are certain foods that are really important that we incorporate in our diet to stay healthy and feel well, energetic and so forth? Sure. Yeah. So we're blessed to live here in the central coast of California, where you can basically grow anything. I'm a big advocate of eating local and seasonal. Mm -hmm. Uh, The food just tastes better. Uh, There's a lot of local farmers who have a lot of delivery services uh, of, you know, kale, green, spinach, anything that grows and can go bad or spoil produce is always my favorite foods. Anything that has a long shelf life, I'm always concerned about. I'm always concerned about the preservatives associated with it. So yeah, I like food that goes bad. And if you can eat it before it goes bad, then you're going to really maximize that nutritional value. Uh, So for me, uh, anything seasonal, local that can be go bad is probably my favorite veggies and fruits that, that we can incorporate. Now, a lot of people don't realize, but as we get older, especially we become magnesium deficient or, and people also, you know, you'll, you know, they don't understand the importance of maybe having zinc incorporated in their daily diet. Can you explain to people why those two um, vitamins and and minerals are so important for us in our daily diet and health? Exactly. So our body does a great job and our kidneys, especially filtering out everything we need. And when we're not getting adequate amounts of not just magnesium, but sodium, potassium, and all our other important electrolytes, we start to feel early signs of fatigue, headache, and dizziness. And this is our body's early signs telling us we may be deficient or we're not doing something right. Right. And it's unfortunate when we start to hear people talk about, you know, chronic fatigue now, talk about daily headaches. It's unfortunately too common. And if you were to break down these individuals diet, and like I said, going back to my favorite exercise, tell me what you ate yesterday. Yeah, you'd be really surprised that, you know, there's at least one fast food. Unfortunately, there's usually some uh, skipping of meals. And when we're missing these nutritional basics, especially with magnesium affecting our sleep, our mentation, we really start to see how across the board, we are not doing the basics right. And uh, I'm, I'm really a huge advocate of just doing the basics right before we start million dollar workups. And we're, you know, I'd say overwhelmingly, we start to see that most of these issues that people are experiencing mm-hmm. are dietary, lack of exercise and basic hydration. Now, can you explain to people why exercise is so important, but you don't have to be an exercise guru where you have to be in the gym for like an hour or two hours, you know, just even 15 minutes, 20 minutes of simple exercises can change your whole, you know, um, your whole body and the way you feel just circulating that blood in your system, the circulation of stretching and so forth. Tell, explain to people how exercise has a huge impact. Of course. So as a late bloomer to exercise myself, I never believed in the runner's high until I uh, really pushed myself to be exercising a little bit more. And with the pandemic going on and COVID, anxiety and depression are significantly increasing. Or I think they were probably there, but we're starting to see it more vocalized. Uh, My number one treatment for anxiety uh, is exercise. And believe it or not, our body really benefits from not only daily, as you mentioned, anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes can go a long way, but our bodies are meant to, we're meant to move. And unfortunately, with a lot of our jobs these days, we're in front of the computer, we're typing and staring at screens with bad posture. This is not the way humans were uh, evolved to be. uh, And it's important that we remember that if we're not moving our bodies, we're going to start to lose muscle mass and muscle atrophy. And that has consequences as we age, it becomes a lot harder to build muscle and to lose fat. So it's important that we do anything we can. I find the Apple fitness very helpful. I find it that, you know, a 10 minute little exercise or even on YouTube, if it's a dancing class, any kind of movement really goes a long way. And that helps with a lot of sleep issues and obviously a lot of fatigue issues. It seems counter productive to go out and exercise when you're tired, but it really helps refresh the body and improve. 
Because you see so many people, you know, I, I, I talk to people, they suffer from anxiety. Anxiety is big. You, you talk, you know, I, I talk to so many um, clients and they, they talk about how they are experiencing anxiety and, you know, that's, that's very big. And also sleep issues. I have people that keep telling me I can't relax my mind at night. It keeps going and it keeps thinking. And I just can't fall asleep because I'm constantly thinking. And you're saying simple exercise, just just exercise to move and and get your body going and because you know and it could it could actually help cure those two issues correct definitely and i think unfortunately uh sometimes in medicine we're quick to prescribe a pill for something and i think when we really sit down and look at the overall wellness of a patient are they hydrating how's their stress management are they eating a basic good diet and are they exercising the recommended 150 minutes in a week and I'd say overwhelmingly, most people say no. And that's always our first start to really addressing anxiety and depression. Now, I'm not saying medications aren't appropriate in certain settings, but if we're not doing the basics right, we're not setting ourselves up to succeed. Right. And we really have to set up our, our bodies for our mental wellness as well. So uh, anxiety is rampant and exercise is one part of the complete uh, treatment package. And when people talk about mental health, so many people suffer from all these different mental health issues. You, you know, when you, you know, when I would put anything on the internet about mental health, people would just go right to it because there's so many people out there suffering from all different forms of mental health issues. And what are some things when people are experiencing mental health issues, like we said, anxiety, depression, you know, um, feelings uh, of, uh, you know, stress, you know, what are some things people can do, you know, um, besides exercise that you might find beneficial? Do you find certain vitamins or certain supplements might be good or any other ideas that you might have that could help people it, so they don't have to resort to these drugs? Sure. I, and I think it's very patient specific. I think meditation is a great part of it. Yoga, Tai Chi, these are great alternatives to uh, medication. Mm -hmm. And really it comes down to why are we anxious and depressed? Uh, you know, being a fully functional adult who's holding a full-time job, paying bills is very stressful already. Yes. We add a pandemic and watching the news is stressful, no matter where you are on the spectrum. And I think ultimately all of these things, passive and both actively stressing us out, has yeah. really caused a very anxious, depressed population. And I think, you know, I wish there was a supplement that I could recommend today because... I would be prescribing it all the time. I think really it comes down to a day to day and people feeling heard that they're stressed out and depressed and providing reassurance. Right. And that's why I feel that, you know, especially during COVID, we didn't have these community outreaches the same. We didn't, no. we didn't get to see our friends and talk about how stressed we are. And uh, so back to the very basics, if we look at a good diet, hydration, exercise, I think we can go a long way to at least putting us in a position to succeed when it comes to anxiety and depression. Now, have, have you seen this carry over now that, that um, COVID has, you know, lightened up, the strain of COVID isn't as severe as the first strain. And it seems to be, you know, even though we have COVID will never go away, it will always be here. It's going to be like the flu, but, you know, with vaccines and with different strands reoccurring, the, it seems to become less and less severe. But do you think the everything that people suffer from when COVID, you know, when the, during the lockdown, do you think it carried over those mental behaviors, the issues that they went through? Do you think a lot of people are still suffering from post, you know, COVID, COVID issues? Definitely. I think there's a certain degree of PTSD and, and I see it even in my community, my geriatric community there at Karma Valley Manor. I feel that People are afraid to interact, to go out, to, to eat together. You know, the basic joys that I think retirees specifically enjoy, you know, vacationing becomes, oh, I don't want to go to Italy. I've been saving, you know, my life savings to go to Italy and I don't want to go because of X, Y, and Z. And I really try to encourage them, you know, now with the oral antivirals that we have for treatments and the outcomes are significantly improved. I'm yes. a huge advocate of people getting out there rejoining their communities, going for that wine tasting, going to that trip that they, you know, would otherwise, especially two years ago, would never thought was a reality. So uh, 
I'm a huge advocate of individuals really re-engaging. So a lot of those issues they dealt with before and during, I think have only been magnified, if not intensified. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, especially with when it comes to mental health, I think it's, it's really a forefront of our health. If we're not feeling, if we're feeling anxious and depressed, you know, fatigue becomes overwhelming and it's hard to function and it's hard to do the day-to-day life. So yeah, uh, I, I think a big part of it is, is just providing that reassurance that one, we're all in this together and we're yes. all feeling similar. You're not uniquely You're not depressed. You're not unique, exactly, uniquely anxious. Uh, you know, I, I was that way as well. And, you know, it's hard for me now to go out with my toddler to the park and I see her touching germs and, oh my God, <laughs> my insides are exploding. Yeah, but she's a kid and she needs to go out there and she needs to socialize. So it's hard to sometimes follow my own advice, but I'm out there at the parks with my little one now. So, Right. And if people want to take extra precautions, they still could wear masks if they want. They still can sanitize their hands there, you know, and they can other take other precautions if that is that's what they need to make themselves feel say in a safer environment, you know, mentally, exactly right. it makes them feel better. Now, when you talk about, you know, um, dehydration, you just brought it up. Now, electrolytes, um, there are a lot of um, drinks or there's a lot of, you know, electrolytes that you could just pour into water. Now, do you suggest electrolytes for, you know, does that help the dehydration? Yes, it does. So I think there's a lot of newer hydration multipliers, as they like to call it, that they use uh, to help with electrolytes, especially with my geriatric patients who, you know, it's a nice way to round out that diet. I just want to be caution those who find those electrolytes helpful that there's a lot of sugar in them. So mm-hmm. I would look for the no sugar, right. paleo versions, but I find those as great alternatives to help, you know, when you're looking at those six to eight glasses of water, it can help kind of replace the electrolytes helps also with a lot of cramping at night, you know, if we're having some kind of uh, deficiency there. So I, I like to In my personal practice, I like to advocate for those uh, electrolyte replacements with no sugar. So now when people are getting older, you know, for mental health, isn't it good to establish different hobbies, different things to constantly keep your mind working that sitting in front of the TV, watching your favorite shows Mm -hmm. is not a good thing. A lot of people, you know, they go to work, they're tired or they, you know, they do whatever, you know, even retired people, they go out, they have fun and everything like that, but then they come home and they're tired. And isn't it good to utilize your mind, either puzzles, this, that, whatever the case may be, doesn't it, doesn't it help and, and maybe refrain people from the possibilities of dementia or Alzheimer's? It, it, not that it can prevent it, but it kind of, you know, can help it in some way. Definitely. And I think it's hard, right? I'm guilty of binging television. It's so easy. and so <laughs> passive, Yeah, you know, and especially with the production values now, it's so easy. I think you know, it's, it's really kind of like exercise. You have to put yourself out there and you have to prioritize it and dedicate it. You know, at Karma Valley Manor, we have a lot of groups that, you know, they have daily bridge groups, they have daily golf groups. So I find group activities, not only great and engaging, but also keeping your mind sharp by engaging in conversations, intellectual conversations, uh, being challenged is always an important way to, to help your mind reading, you know, um, actively reading any kind of literature that's coming out. I think that's always helpful. Uh, But like I said, just like exercise and healthy eating, it takes effort. And I think, unfortunately, we default to a lot of things that are easily and passive, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, I also find that as we get older, our memory starts to decrease. Like we're not you know, we're still sharp, but we're, you know, sometimes it's hard to remember things. You might go have a blank, oh, you know, and then it takes you a second and it might come to you or you just can't remember a certain situation, you know, and it seems like as we get older, I call it the elderly dementia where we don't, we don't, (laughs) we don't have dementia, but, you know, our mind, our memories aren't as sharp as they used to be. Now, are there any, anything that you suggest to your patients to help them, you know, have, um, to, to help them build their memory, make it sharper or stay stable and consistent so it doesn't decline over the course of the years? Sure. So word finding is uh, uh, one of the first signs that we start to feel, oh my goodness, is this, am I going to get this? Uh back to harp on the basics, really in terms of putting your, you know, we, none of us know if we're predisposed to get a certain type of dementia or not, Right. but I'm all about putting yourself in the best position to succeed. 
Exactly. And when you're eating a healthy diet, you're exercising regularly, you're minimizing your alcohol intake, you're really engaging with your community. As a human, you're putting yourself in the best position to succeed. And uh, again, I wish there was a magic do Sudoku twice today <laughs> on Monday, Monday. I wish I had that magic way of doing it. And some people need that. And I, I totally get it. But uh, if you really look at your day-to-day diet, exercise, and hydration, I would say overwhelmingly, we're not doing the basics, right? So we're not already putting ourselves in a position to succeed. So right. for me, that's that's always step step one. And I will always advocate for that. Uh, and again, going back to my favorite exercise, you can imagine some of the answers I get when I say, please walk me through your previous day. And they start to tell you, <laughs> you know. I lie to my primary care sometimes about, you know, oh, I had three glasses of wine, not one, right? And it's yeah. important to really just engage and be honest with ourselves. Being honest with ourselves is hard. Yeah, it it, it could be very hard. I find pe- um, being honest with yourself is hard because then when you realize that you're not doing the right thing, you need to change. And some people fear change. And that, you know, that's one of the big things because you have to do something about it. And people get scared, you know, they get scared of change or putting in the effort. You know, they want to be better, but they just don't want to put the effort in, you know. And what do you suggest to those people who, you know, they do have desires and they would like to be, you know, a certain way and feel a certain way, but they're just not motivated. Well, how do you increase someone's motivation? If you see somebody that comes to you and they just, you could just tell just by the way they're speaking or acting that there's a lack of motivation, but they do want to feel better because they wouldn't be in your office if they didn't want to feel better. Sure, exactly. So what do you do to kind of boost their motivation level and see the importance? I think meaningful change is important. Small steps, small milestones that are attainable early on can really be motivating. You know, uh, it's easy to say, I'm going to go paleo and exercise every other day. It's easy to say it, but going and out and actually doing it is the tough part. So I really, you know, in those situations say, okay, let's look at decreasing increasing our calories by 500 for, you know, a certain amount of days and exercising X amount with reasonable change. Right. Um, that's one. The second thing is always having, uh, you know, a buddy or someone to help or some, someone specifically to be your partner in crime. And it may be your significant other. It may be a friend, or this is a great way to put yourself out there and join a gym class and things like that. Yeah. There's a lot of great communities out there, a lot of different gym classes that, You know, in the beginning, we're a little hesitant, but then it becomes part of our daily life and cycle. So uh, the first thing would be reasonable, small milestones. And the second thing would be finding a good buddy. And I feel that's so important because a lot of times, you know, your buddy could be the most important person in your life that actually motivates you to really do better, you know, in life. And, and, you know, you don't have to have a cluster of people. It's just that one person on the sideline with those pom-poms rooting you on and it can change your whole demeanor. And it's amazing, I think. No, exactly right. And that's the hard part, finding that one person. (laughs) Yes. Uh, and also the other thing that I always talk about, you know, in terms of meaningful change, in terms of lifestyle, especially going to the grocery store, that's where a lot of our setting us, ourselves up for success in terms of dietary wise. You yes. know, I, like I mentioned earlier, products, produce that goes bad is my favorite. Once you start going into those middle aisles with a lot of preservatives, we're really yes. putting ourselves in a bad position. And also when you you go grocery shopping and you put that bag of chips in there and you're going to say, I'm going to eat that in two to three weeks. And I personally devour it within 24 hours. That's <laughs> yeah. really where you, where you can really make the change going to the yeah. grocery shop, store appropriately. Now, a lot of, you know, a lot of times you see things and, you know, they'll be like, uh, they'll say sugar-free or, you know, and, and they'll have other market employees, but you know, they don't realize that it might be sugar-free, but they're putting some other ingredients to give it that taste, that, that, that sugary taste. And exactly. that's just as bad as the sugar, correct? It had, you know, you know, monk fruit alternatives or other uh, stevia products. We don't have the same data yet of what long-term use of that. And unfortunately people want, you know, they want a chocolate cookie and they will even eat a fake chocolate cookie to get that. <laughs> I, I really advise my patients, look, if you really want a chocolate cake, have the real thing. Don't mess around, do mm-hmm. it right. And then, you know, extend the the next time you're going to have it as right. opposed to these alternatives. It, it sometimes gives us that it's okay. 
And uh, I'm guilty of it as well. You know, I get the keto ice cream and I destroy the whole pint. Doesn't make it any better <laughs> if I had two bites of the Hagen dogs, right? So right. We're constantly making. Uh, I feel like we're constantly challenging ourselves in ways, but also making excuses for ourselves. Yes. Then, uh, until we're really honest with ourselves on what we're trying to do and achieve, it's okay to have the occasional chocolate cake with real sugar. Oh my yeah. goodness! And it tastes that much better too. And uh, the fake pastas for me, I can't do it. I rather, if I'm going to eat a pasta, we're going to eat pasta. So right. zucchini noodle is a good alternative. But in general, I think this is just finding ways that we could make compromises with ourselves. As long mm -hmm. as we're making the right choice, 80% of the time, we're going to be okay. And right. I, I, think, I think that's an important way to live our lives. I feel moderation. If we do things in moderation- exactly it's, it's okay. You know, it's, it's when you do it on a consistent basis, that's when you're going to run into problems. And I also find, you know, I don't know how your intake is, but if you turn things over and you start to read the ingredients, I always say, if you can't pronounce it, it can't be very good for you. How do you feel exactly. about that? No, definitely. And you start to see, you know, like, uh, especially the, the newer paleo products or, oh, this is keto. And you look at those ingredients and they're pretty extensive as well. And if you had just gotten that cookie with flour, sugar, water. <laughs> yeah. Ultimately, I think, you know, those are, are better for you. But but yes, it, it gets scary once you start looking again in those middle aisles of the grocery store where they have so many preservatives. So for me, stick to the outside, stick to the food that spoils. That's good. You know what the ingredients are. It's just spinach. Uh, if you want to dress it up a little bit with a little bit of butter, a little bit of salt, that's okay. Yeah, uh, cooking at home is a, a great way to combat a lot of these unnecessary ingredients that go into preserving food. Now, I also find as we get older, you know, a lot of people, you know, they look to how they look on the outside, and if and it's very important to them, so, you know, they know they're going to get older, and their their you know their outside physical aspects are going to change, but you know, is there a way by taking care of yourself that you could actually? you know, increase the longevity of your looks, maybe the wrinkles or the glowing skin, or maybe even, you know, slowing down the hair loss or, you mm. know, all that good stuff, or even maintaining your muscles a little bit longer and not having the saggy arms or the saggy neck and so forth. Is there anything that you ever suggest to your patients to try to maintain that? Of course. Influence? Yeah. And I, I think it goes, goes back to what I, you know, the basics that I, I recommend as always, if you're not eating a fully well-rounded diet, you're not going to have the vitamins you need for uh, your body to, to maintain uh, where it's at now. The other thing too is, you know, alcohol intake and tobacco use. You know, I'm, we always have to evaluate our recreational yeah. uh, substances uh, and make sure that moderation is key when it comes to that, because you start to see that the wear and tear in the body after extended uses of both of those things. Right. And then hydration and exercise, you know, that flushed feeling you get when you have a great workout. Uh, that's great. That circulation you're getting to your whole body is just so excellent for just longevity of those skin cells. So I would, again, recommend basics. And as I mentioned earlier, when most of the population, in my opinion, is not doing the basics right. right. We look for quick fixes yes. and the quick fixes always have side effects. And, you know, I, I find that because when you when you see articles on a quick fix, you see so many people liking the article because people lack patience and they want they want to see results right away. But people don't understand that. If you want something, it's going to take baby steps and it's going to take time and the best results come about but it takes a little time and it's baby steps little by little by little, but the overall result is going to be far better than these fast, you know, quick, you know, quick type of diets or whatever, because you tend to find that when people do those type of things, you might see results, but all of a sudden they resort back to where they were very quickly. Oh, definitely. And uh, motivation is important. And that's why those small, meaningful milestones are so important early on. And those really can cascade to larger changes. Uh, but we're all guilty of it. Uh, sometimes we have setbacks, but as long as we get back on and make sure that we understand our long-term goal. Uh, and that's why I love saying to my patients, hey, if you make the right decision, dietarily speaking, 80% of the time, yeah, you're going to see changes, right? 100%. Uh, but it takes time. And we're all impatient and I, myself included.
Now, you know, every patient is different. Every patient reacts different and has a different body, you know, composition. But if a person is getting older, you know, are there specific um, vitamins and minerals that you would suggest that they may consider incorporating in their diet that would be beneficial as we get older? So I always recommend following up closely with your primary care physician and making mm -hmm. sure that the basics are right. Uh, you know, we do basic blood work for a reason because yes. we're looking for early changes and deficiencies. Yes. Uh, especially as we see cognition changes in our patients, we forget to eat, we forget to eat healthy. And as we get older, it's easier to do our frozen meals than it is to get that produce. And I understand that that's a, that's a problem we're facing across the United States. It's yes, easy it for our geriatric patients to put it in the microwave and take it out. Right. Unfortunately, that is not the best foods. You know, B12 has always been one of those that we always want to look out for to make sure there's no deficiencies because B12 complications can lead to what may seem like early uh, neurological changes. So that's always an important one. And then, of course, we always want to make sure our potassium levels and our sodium levels are appropriate. And it gives us some insight, too, on their hydration. So routine okay. blood work really gives us a lot of insight if we're having a well-balanced diet and hydrating. And then, yeah. like I mentioned earlier, the kidneys, uh, making sure that we're ruling out any kind of kidney disease. Yes. So uh, I'm all about good water, water, water. Yeah, I'm big on that too. And, you know, I, I go every six months to get a, a full, not your regular blood work, but I go to a functional medicine doctor and they do an extensive workout on, all, all, on a bunch of different things. And they look to see what vitamins, what nutrients, you know, how my hormone levels are, you know, they look at every little thing because they're trying to prevent something that may occur in the future you know, but they could tell, you know, what's good, what's not, you know, how's my cortisol level. And, you know, these are things that, you know, people should take, you know, into consideration that certain doctors will prescribe certain blood tests that not all doctors will prescribe, but, you know, the more intensive the blood work, the more doctors can tell, you know, what's going on and what's not right and what's great and so forth. Correct? Yeah, I find that it's, that's where the primary care relationship is so important, right? Mm -hmm. Once someone gets to know you, understand, and hey, you're I'm not feeling right, and that's where you can really go down any rabbit hole with your primary care doctor and really find out what's wrong. So, I, when it comes to blood panels, I think it's very patient specific. I think it's also very important that we're mindful of certain lab results. Um, it's important to keep everything in context. And that's why that relationship is so important, because if you have someone who knows you really well, yes. they'll be able to help guide you appropriately on what's exactly. appropriate and what, yeah. Now, if before you go, can you just give a couple of pointers to your patient? Like everything that we've just discussed, you know, um, is there any important factors that you would want the audience to just remember from this whole conversation we had? Sure. I would just, my top five tips that I've been kind of telling a lot of my patients, the first is diet and just make sure that you continue to, to reevaluate your diet because we can get complacent on our weekly uh, routine, like every Monday, taco Tuesdays. And it's important that we just understand that fresh produce is the best and with adequate protein. So diet is, is my number one big uh, takeaway here. My second one would be of course, hydration closely, uh, to making sure that we're having the adequate amount of water we should be drinking and reevaluate those six to eight glasses of water. Looking for non-sugar electrolyte replacements, I think are a great way to bolster your hydration levels. The third thing is I want you to keep moving, make sure that you're always moving your body and make sure that whatever your fitness level is, is that you always push yourself a little more. The body is open to, to any kind of resistance. So making sure that we push our bodies as much as we can the fourth, mental wellness. I would love everyone to go out there and just make a new friend, make a new gym membership, force yeah. ourselves to re-engage in our community. That would be my fourth. And my fifth one is uh, I myself love a good glass of wine being here in the California Central yes. Coast, but moderation is key when it comes to alcohol and making sure that uh, we are mindful that sharing a glass of wine is great with a new friend, <laughs> making sure that we continue our hydration. So that's kind of my overview on how to see how we can make small changes that I think ultimately lead to, to larger changes overall. That's excellent. Now, is there a website or somewhere we can find you that, you know, people um, can go to, to learn more about you and everything that you offer? 
Sure. So I'm uh, at the Carmel Val Valley Manor, uh, and I'm the medical director there. So we have a lot of great information about how we have geriatric specific uh, recommendations in terms of lifestyle tips. We're, we're fortunate at the Carmel Valley Manor to be one of the new top US 100 uh, independent and assisted living facilities. So I think we have a great framework of how to, to do this. And I think we're only improving um, and making sure that that's what we do. So uh, always open to, to any, anyone that needs any advice when it comes to geriatric lifestyle. And again, my last thing is, please go out and make a new friend because everyone's looking for friends. Yes. Yes. I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much for, you know, taking the time to, you know, give our audience all this important and very valuable information. Um, it was great having you on the show and thank you so much, uh, thank you Dr. So much. Liz, for coming on the show and sharing all this value information. And I hope when, you know, you can come back and, you know, we could talk some more about, you know, of healthy course. living, because I think people really need to understand the importance of how important it is to live a healthy lifestyle and maintain one. Definitely. Thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate your time as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.